Turn with me to John chapter 3. Hope you brought some extra amens today. Amen means that you are in agreement with God's word. Agreement with God, God's word produces life. Amen. All right. Looks like you guys are primed up already. I heard Mr. Kenneth, you had him cranked up. Where are you at? There you are. In the back room, you had it primed up. All right. Y'all ready to receive? Yes. Has God been good to you? Yes. Come on. Let's read from John chapter 3. How many of you have watched The Chosen with Nicodemus? Remember that scene where he was up on the roof? With Jesus, he, he finally, he met with Jesus. And that, that would so be me. When I, when I meet Jesus, I'm just going to fall on my knees and just the redeemer of Israel and just, just worship him. Amen? Amen? And so Nicodemus, he, he come, he's, a, he's a ruler, he's a Pharisee, and he, he comes to Jesus at night and he makes this statement to Jesus in, in verse in verse 2, I don't know if I put that up there, but he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. In other words, Jesus, we know that you've been anointed by God. That there's something unique and very different about you. And he said, for no one could do the signs that you do unless God is with you. How many of you know that the Bible says that God is with us? Jesus told his disciples, he said, I'll be with you until the end of the age. So Jesus is with every believer. And Jesus said this phrase, whoever believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. At the end of Mark, Jesus said that these signs will accompany those who believe. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll see them recover. They'll cast out demons. In other words, the supernatural follows believers. Are you with me, church? I walk away from our services just reeling over what God is doing. Our Friday night prayer meetings, we have them at the end of, of, of every month. And just to see the power of God touch people, people get caught up in the joy of the Lord, in the presence of God. Our Wednesday night meetings, uh, Danielle, she preached this last Wednesday. And I got to say, it was a heavy message. It was challenging. But how many of you know the church needs to be challenged? Uh, I think the modern day church has watered down Christianity to where a Christian is someone who who has received forgiveness of sins. And when they die, they're going to go to heaven. But being a Christian is so much more than that. Amen. Amen. Whenever they called Christians Christians, believers Christians, I should say, in the book of Acts, it, it was in a derogatory sense. It was not a compliment. They were saying these little, these little Christs, they're running around here and they're, they're, they're casting out devils and, and they're upending our idol making businesses, putting them out of business. They're turning our world upside down. They're healing the sick and casting out devils and they can all preach. They all look just like Jesus. They can tell that they had been with Jesus. That's what a Christian is supposed to look like. Someone who could preach just like Jesus. Someone who can heal just like Jesus. Cast out devils just like Jesus. There's no watered down version of a Christian. Amen. And we're going to talk about some of that today. But I walk away reeling over what God is doing in our midst. There's supernatural happenings taking place in this church. Amen. On Wednesday night for the altar call, I mean, Danielle, she didn't even really give an altar call. And and all of a sudden, people just began to experience the presence of God right there where where they were sitting. I heard laughing. I heard weeping. And then and then she just went for the jugular. She said, whoever wants more of God, come up to the front. People ran up to the front. They were getting touched. Little Chloe, Chad and Mallory's daughter, 
She was sitting there in her seat right next to dad, and she was just getting touched by God. She was weeping. I laid hands on her. I prayed for her. She began to shake. And even after the service, when her and Vivian, they were in children's church, they were, they were coloring, her hand was still shaking because of the power of God. This is normal Christianity. When you look at the book of Acts, the supernatural happened on every page. That should be the story of your life. And if you're a believer, if you really believe in this book, you're going to have supernatural happenings all the time. Amen. Why is it that denominations, they tell you to be like Jesus, yet they tell you that miracles aren't for today? Just be good like Jesus. But, you know, all that other stuff, it died after 172 years. Really? Says who? Because the book doesn't say that. In fact, we're in Acts 29 right now. Amen. God's still writing his story. Amen. And so the key to walking in the supernatural is a renewed mind is having a revelation that you are royalty. You're just going to have to get over yourself and recognize that you are royalty. That's who God made you to be. Hallelujah. No one can do the signs that you do unless God is with them. And I love, I love how Jesus just totally bypasses what this revelation that Nicodemus is having. And in the words of Nacho Libre, he gets down to the nitty gritty. <laughs> and, and Jesus just says, unless a man is born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. Let me, let me read it to you from the Amplified Version. It says, Jesus answered him, John 3 and verse 3, I assure you and, and most solemnly say to you that unless a person is born again. That means to be reborn from above, to be spiritually transformed, to be renewed, to be sanctified. How many of you, you've encountered someone that really got born again? I know that there's not different levels of being born again, but it's, in, it's interesting, whenever you lead people in the sinner's prayer, some people, it's like, say this after me. Say, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> and, and then you have someone like an Alexis, who she, she's going through, I think, three or four services at, at that point. And when, when Danielle gave the altar call, she ran up here with tears streaming down her face and said, Jesus, I give you my life. And, and she was spiritually transformed. This girl doesn't even look like she did just a few months ago. She was born again. She was born from above. You can tell when God really moves into somebody's house. Amen. They're alive to God. Amen. Now, I, I was at Walmart the other day, and, and there was this lady. She's always standing by, by the front door. And uh, I kind of interact with her a little bit, and, and, you know, she's always cold, so I offer, hey, you want my coat? And, and the other day, I just looked at her, I'm like, there's something different about you. You always have joy. I'm like, you know Jesus, don't you? She said, I love Jesus. I said, me too. And she gave me a big old hug. I could just tell the life of God was on the inside of her. That This is a spiritual transformation that takes, pe that takes place in the lives of people. It's spiritual. It's spiritual. You can't really tell exactly from the way that people dress. You know, it's not, well, they don't have any tattoos because they're saying, no, there's a, there's a heart change. And, and it begins to affect everything. The way they walk, the way they talk, they've got joy. They, they, they look like this. Like you just see teeth, you know, white teeth. Amen. It, it's a spiritual transformation. And, and you, you fall in love with Jesus. You remember when you were younger and you met, you, met, you met the one, right? And you'd start talking to them and you'd tell other people about them and you got all like googly-eyed. That googly-eyed sensation that you feel towards Jesus, that should never end. It, 
If it has ended, then you've backslidden. You've walked away from the presence of the Lord. Although he's always with you, it's just a mindset. He's always with you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. Amen. It's a spiritual transformation. You, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, huh? You mean you want me to go back in, in my mama's belly? And you want me to be born again? And Jesus, no, you don't get it. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Your spirit becomes alive to God. Amen. And Nicodemus is like, how can these things be? Jesus says, you're the teacher of Israel, and you don't get this basic thing? And look at what Jesus says in verse 12. He said, if I told you earthly things, he's speaking of earthly things to Nicodemus. If I told you earthly things, that is things that happen right here on earth, and you do not believe, how will you believe and trust me when I tell you of heavenly things? Can you sense Jesus' heart? Like, man, I'm wanting to unpack some spiritual realities, some truths for you. Jesus came to give us spiritual realities. And one of those realities is righteousness. And I touched on this last week. Righteousness is the ability to stand in the presence of God without guilt and without shame. Just as Adam, when he walked with God and talked with God, he, he didn't look down. You, you ever get around somebody and you can tell that they have an inferiority complex? They, 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 they look away and they, they don't know quite where to look. Listen, when Adam walked with God, it was eyeball to eyeball. Like there was no guilt, there was no shame, there was no sin or anything like that. Well, that that's what Jesus brought us back to. A place where as a believer, you receive the righteousness of God. So there's no more sin consciousness. Right. To the pure, all things are pure. Right. And now you're not inferior to God. God actually created you like him. You are in his class. You are like God. Jesus recreated us in the image and the likeness of God. Wow. Wow. It's his righteousness that he gave to us. So we can stand in his presence with no condemnation. No sense of inferiority to God. Eyeball to eyeball. Wow. And righteousness is the ability to stand in the presence of the devil and demons without fear. Knowing that we are more than conquerors in Christ. When you're born again, you enter the kingdom of God as a new creation. When someone asks, well, what is a Christian? I think the average definition would be, well, it's someone who is, is now saved, that they've, they've been forgiven of their sins, and when they die, they're going to go to heaven. I think a better definition of what a Christian is, is that they are a new creation. You know, we've seen new creations over the last 120 years. I'm just amazed by all the things that mankind has invented. But 2,000 years ago, God had a brand new invention. <laughs> he made new creations. Jesus is the prototype. If you want to know who you are, look at Jesus. That's who you are. You're royalty. Amen. You're a brand new creation. <laughs> Some people think, well, a Christian is someone who goes to church. There was a lady in, in Cambodia. She had friends who were Christians, so she thought she was a Christian. Because I have friends that are Christians. If I slap 
some red paint on myself and put myself on a guitar stand. That, that doesn't mean I'm a, I'm a guitar. If I give in tithes and offerings and I can sing, you know, Almighty oh, Ones, that doesn't make me a Christian. Just because you go to church or you're a member of a denomination doesn't make you a Christian. A Christian is someone who has been born from above and they are a new creation in Christ. Amen. And when you become a new creation, you begin to operate on a different level. It's called the high life. You used to live the low life, but now you've been called to live the high life in God. And you enter into what is called Zoe life. I think I said that right. Zoe or Zoe. A little Greek for you there. Zoe life. Jesus said that the devil came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. This is God's kind of life that has been given to you. Not, not just any old life. Jesus came to give us God's quality of life. Who? Hello. Are you with me? Are you getting anything out of this? I hope so. Hallelujah. Turn with me in your Bibles. To 2 Peter, chapter 1. <clears throat> Second Peter. Chapter 1, verse 2. Are you there? Yeah. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. Grace and peace are multiplied in your life. What is grace? Grace is God's empowerment to help you do what you cannot do without him. Grace and peace actually multiplies in your life through what? Through knowledge. What you know and think about God is the most important thing that you know. This is why week after week, we're encouraging you to spend time in the word of God. Because grace multiplies to you as you know God and know his word and know his truth. Like it, it, it multiplies. It's not addition. It, it begins to multiply in your life through knowledge. Amen. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us, how many things? All things. Everything that you need is already in your heavenly spiritual bank account. So if you find yourself in need, just begin to command, Lord, I thank you. I thank you that I have wisdom. When that bill comes in the mail and you don't have enough, say, Lord, I thank you I have enough and this bill will be paid. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Everything that we need has been given to us. It says all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything that you need for life and godliness has already been given to you. Through the knowledge, here we go again, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly. That means extremely. 
exceedingly great and precious promises. I love the promises of God. They are very precious to me. The things that God has spoken over my life, I, I, I don't wear them like a keychain with all these little keys. Yeah, God called me to do this. He called me to do that. He called me to do this. He called me to do that. No, I, I have, like Mary, she treasured the things that were spoken about Jesus. What he, she, she treasured them in her heart. Danielle and I, we are treasuring the promises that God has given to us. They are precious. And my aim in life is to see every promise that God has given me come to fruition in my life. I'm not backing off. Every single day I'm putting one foot in front of the other towards the promises that God has given to me. Are you doing the same? Listen, we access those promises by faith. Exercise your faith. Every day, make the right decision to see these promises happen in your life. A lot of people, they want to blame generational curses on everything. They use it as an excuse to continue on in sin. Well, mom and dad drank, so we drank. Mom and dad had cancer, so we have cancer. It's a generational curse. But I would attribute a lot of what we go through to our decisions. The choices that we make every single day. Because the truth is that curse, the curse has been broken. So if the parents, if they were involved in that, God bless them. But I'm not walking in that. Amen. I'm going to walk in everything that Jesus paid for me. We are free from the curse. Yes. Make right decisions today. Yes. Your destiny will be forged by the decisions you make today. Yes. Amen, that's just a side note. <laughs> Precious promises that look, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. That through these promises that are written in God's word, you may become partakers. That means that you take part in what? God's divine nature. We have the DNA of God on the inside of us. Are you with me, church? We have the DNA of God on the inside of us. God promises, through his promise, through his promises, that we can become participants and we can fellowship with his nature. Wow. That's incredible. That is so good. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. You know, new creation people, they operate by a different set of laws. Are you with me? They operate by a different set of laws. Look at Jesus. Jesus is walking on water, taking a little boy's lunch and multiplying it. Not only is he paying his taxes, he's paying other people's taxes with a, a coin in a fish's mouth. Jesus operated on another level. He operated by different laws. There's a law in place called the law of gravity. It's a very real law. But there's a greater law and dynamic in place called the law of aerodynamics. And that law of aerodynamics, it actually supersedes the law of gravity. I know because I've, I've spent a lot of time in the air. I've seen that law in place. And so Jesus, he operated by different laws. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no 
condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Everything that you need is found in Christ. In fact, your life is hidden in Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So everything that you need is found in Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When we become free of condemnation, our faith begins to grow to miracle working power. Amen. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Sin is an umbrella where poverty Sickness, disease, depression, all of that falls under the umbrella of sin. And so the law of the spirit of life has set me, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Jesus operated by this law. That's why when a leper came up to him pleading for him to heal them, Jesus took his clean hands and would touch the unclean leper and make him clean. Jesus, being clean, touched the unclean leper and made him clean. He operated by this law. So did John G. Lake. John G. Lake, he went out to South Africa in, I think it's 1908, and he was there for five years, saw about 100,000 people saved, saw about that many uh, healings and, and miracles take place. But during that time, the bubonic plague had broken out in South Africa, and people were suffering from fever, from delirium, and they had something called, um, I think it's called buboes or something. Did I pronounce that right? Anybody? Rick, can you help me? I'm on my own. <laughs> well, it, lymph nodes in the armpit and the groin area, it would become inflamed. And people were dying in, in droves. And John G. Lake is out right in the middle of it. He's caring for the sick and he's burying the dead on a daily basis. Well, Britain comes along, they bring all kinds of medical supplies. They bring a corps of doctors. And they're watching John G. Lake just handle these sick people, these dying people all around him, and he's not getting infected. And, and they said, how in the world are you able to touch these people? They are so infectious, and you're not getting infected. He said, well, the law of the spirit of life operates in me, and it has set me free from the law of sin and death. And so he convinced them. He said, I want you to take some of the plague foam that is on the lungs of one of these dead corpse and, and put it underneath the microscope. And they looked at it and that, that organism, it was alive. The plague was alive under the microscope. Then he said, now stick it on my finger. And the doctor said, no, we don't want it. But he convinced them. So they put the plague foam on his hand. And guess what? It began to die in his hand. John G. Lake is no one special. That law is available for you as a child of God, as someone who is royalty to walk in that. And listen, we're going to have to have a revelation of that in the times that we're living in. Amen. You need a revelation of royalty that the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. Amen. This is good stuff. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Let me end with this. 
The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Notice that's past tense. Has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us, God chose you. You may have thought, well, you know, I accepted, I I hate that term, the day I accepted Jesus. It's like, really? (laughs) I think you were the one that needed to be accepted, all right? Of course, salvation is available to everybody. But God chose us. He chose you specifically. He saw you Hajites, Jonesboroites, Westonites. And he chose you right in the middle of where you were. Not now. Not in 2022. Not 10 years ago. Not 20 years ago. Not 30 years ago. It says, before the foundation of the world, he chose you. Before God laid out any foundation, before he said, let there be light, he said, Donnie, I've got you in mind. I'm writing, this is not just notes. I got a whole book that I'm writing on your life. Things that I have in store for you. These are my plans, says the Lord. Brian, before the foundation of the world, God had you in mind and he chose you out from the crowd to beat you up with his love. Just to shower you with blessings, love and kindness and gentleness. Amen. He chose you before the foundations of the world. We have to get a revelation of who we are in Christ. If you don't know who you are, you won't know how to act. Let me take you to one more scripture. Ephesians chapter 2. When we were born again, we stepped into a whole new position. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy, I feel his presence, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And look at this. And he raised us up together and made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I said this last week, but I I want to end with this. When you walk into a throne room with a king where there's royalty, you don't sit down. We lived in Cambodia. There was a monarch. There was the king. And when the king came to town, everybody stood. Are you with me? You you don't just sit down and throw your feet up on the coffee table and, how's it going, king? Because you're in the presence of royalty. Nowhere in the word of God can you find angels sitting in the throne room of God. But the Bible says that the new creation, that's you and I, born again believers, we are seated in heavenly places with God. Oh, that means you are royalty. Wow. If that doesn't do something for you. <laughs> we, we, are, we are royalty. We are in God's class. God made the birds according to their kind. He made the sea creatures according to their kind. But when God made mankind, he said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. 
God made humanity according to his kind. You are in the same class as God. Now, don't go all weird with that. Okay, we're not God. All right? We're created in his image. We're a spirit like him. Are you with me? So we are seated right now. He, he made us. That's past tense. He made us to sit in heavenly places. So I want to tell you, I know you're sitting down in the natural, but in the spirit, I want to tell you to sit down. Sit down. You are royalty. I want you to close your eyes. Hallelujah. Right now, we are seated in heavenly places. Can you see it? I want you to let the doubt and the unbelief and what religion has taught you to fall by the wayside right now. Because right now, we are in heavenly places. We are seated at the right hand of the Father. And and I see the Father, He's turning to you, son and daughter, and He's saying that you are mine. Jesus paid the price for you to sit at His right hand. And at His right hand are pleasures forevermore. We are in the Father's house. Can you see it, church? Can you see it, church? Look around. Look around. God has given you his best. He's given you heaven's finest. He has the best in store for you. The best plan. The best position. You're seated in heavenly places. My job as a pastor is to lead God's sheep into green pastures. This is it. This is it. If you can begin to see yourself as God sees you, you will never, ever, ever be the same again. You won't talk the same. You see, because when you're royalty, there are certain things that are beneath you. You don't need a curse. You don't need to get angry. Just walk in who you are. You're you're a son. You're a daughter of God. Would you open your heart right now and just, just, just get a revelation. Allow this to make an 18-inch journey from your brain down to your spirit, man. That's the heart of a person. And say, Heavenly Father, give me a revelation of royalty. Hallelujah. Now just uh, just bask in his presence. Just just go there. Just go there. These are green pastures. This is where you're meant to live and to dwell. This is what it means to abide in Christ. To abide in his word. To live in him. To live in life union with him. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. This is what it means to be one with God. Open your spiritual eyes and look around. Look around the throne room of God. 
There's angels. There's the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Hey, there's Peter, James, and John. There's old Moses. There's Elijah. There's my grandpa. All those who have gone before me. This is our home, our true home. And in, in this life, in the earth, in the natural, we are aliens. But heaven is our real home. Jesus told Nicodemus, no one has ascended to heaven except he who came from heaven. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Jesus lived from heaven on the earth. God is calling you, church, to live the ascended life. This is it. This is it sitting at the right hand of the Father. Allow the Lord to take you by the hand as he did Adam and to speak to you concerning life, concerning everything that he has in store for you. Some of you have been wounded. You've been carrying around an orphan spirit. That's why you do the things that you do. That's why you say the things that you say. That's why you act the way that you act. It's because you've been wounded. One encounter with the Lord can heal you and restore you and change you. Allow the Lord with His hand grasping yours to heal those wounds. Allow the Lord to speak to you, to give you fresh revelation that you are royalty. You are royalty. Jesus said, all that the Father has is mine. Well, you're in Christ. So you can say, all that the Father has is mine. So love is mine. The same love that the Father had for Jesus, He has for you. It's not a lesser degree. Receive that love right now and be transformed. The same peace that Jesus had in the middle of the storm in the boat, it's yours. Take it right now. It belongs to you. You're in Christ. All that the Father has is yours. Joy, the joy of the Lord is yours right now. Just receive it. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. We're practicing the presence of God. This is his presence. This is what he's calling you and I to. This is communion. Communing with God dining in his presence and allowing the Father to feed us with heaven's finest. Hallelujah. All that the Father has is yours. Just receive.